Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today is time for another uh, live <laughs> live joinery video. Wow, I should really work on that intro. Uh, today we're going to be doing tongue and groove joints and I did a video recently showing off the Stanley 48. I um, mean if there's any issue with the audio please let me know. We had a problem with it last week because we just changed a bunch of settings so uh, let my wife know. But uh, I did a video recently showing how to work with a Stanley 48 with the, the swing arm on there. And had a lot of other people asking me, well, how do you do it without that? How do you make tongue and groove joints? So uh, I really said, well, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. And I thought that might make a good live video. So we're going to be showing six different ways to make a tongue and groove joint. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I need to do a few um, updates. Um, let's see, I just got back from the Midwest Tool Collectors meet down in Madison, Georgia. That was a ton of fun. Bought a whole pile of tools, which just came in the mail today. So I've got uh, things like the new um, um, skewed shoulder plane and uh, the slick and a few other things coming up. So some fun videos in the making there. Um, and if you don't know what Midwest Tool Collectors is, I have several different things on where to buy hand tools or what is the Midwest Tool Collectors. Um, and I do live videos when I walk through the tool sales. Uh, there's one coming up uh, March. I believe it is up in Matt up in uh, just south of Milwaukee, and then there is How many one. Is no, Milwaukee. Oh. Um, then there is the one happening here in April, uh, just uh, like a mile and a half down the road from me, um, in Rockford, Illinois. And then the national is coming up in June, and that is down in Peoria, Illinois. So there's a lot right around me right now. Um, and at the national, I'll actually be doing a tool talk and doing some demonstration live there. And if you can come for the national, there are people who literally fly from all over the world to come to this because it is the biggest event in the entire world to buy hand tools um, and learn about hand tools and the history and all sorts of things. So it's an entire conference devoted to antique hand tools. Uh, let's see, and then in May, I'm going to be in Maker Central in uh, Birmingham, U UK. UK? <laughs> you want to say Alabama. Yeah, I want to say Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama. Um, so if anyone is going to be out for that, I'm looking forward to meeting you, trying to figure out some way of doing a uh, meetup for that. My wife will also be there with me. So uh, looking forward to uh, to doing that. Am I missing anything for notes? I don't think I am. So let's dive into this. Uh, first, let's actually show what is a, a tongue and groove joint. Uh, a tongue and groove joint is basically that. It's a tongue and a groove, and when they go together, they join the boards, and so they theoretically should have a nice flush face across here. Um, you see these a lot in flooring, so that the two pieces don't want to slide past each other this way. They're not really a structural joint, but they do keep the two pieces level so that one doesn't push past each other. Um, so another place you commonly see them is in joining pieces together for tabletops. And the big reason for that is just to make it easier to joint them, so everything is flat when you go to glue them together, kind of like with biscuits. They don't provide a whole lot of strength in the joint, um, as the glue actually provides a, an incredible amount. But for something like flooring, where you do want a little bit of movement as expansion and contraction happens, um, the tongue and groove is great for this. So you often see this in places where, like the backs of dressers, or um, doing joinery edge to edge, or doing uh, panels and things like that. Uh, this is a, a fairly common way to connect two boards together like that. But how do you actually go about making this? Um, I did a video recently showing how to use a Stanley 48. Uh, this actually has a swing arm on here, so I wanted to demonstrate this again live and just show people how simple this is. Just make sure I'm in focus. Ooh, my tripod's slipping. Let's fix that, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, there we go. And the nice thing about this is you can set it up to then cut. There, you know, it's cutting the tongue. And this one is designed for something a little larger than three quarters. The tongue isn't going to be quite in the center of it. And I just go until it bottoms out. Actually, I'm not going to bottom it out right now. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. It's going to, eh, not bottom it out. It's close enough. I'll bottom it out. I got tongue. Any questions while I'm doing this? Unfortunately, my blade is a little bit too thin, so I have to take a couple shavings off of this. I gotta get, I have to adjust my blade on my 48. But I can just fix it up by taking two shavings off one side and two shavings off the other one. Alright, so let's see. Um, I know you had talked about a 
Christmas drop giveaway at some point mm -hmm. during the show. Um, so hearkening back to drops, Joel Bonin, Thienan, asked if you still think you'll get them shipped out by the end of the week. Yes, I'm hoping to get a lot of them shipped out tomorrow. And whatever I don't get shipped out tomorrow, I should have shipped out Saturday. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I just ordered all of the, well, I got all the orders. And I've got them sitting right over there. Here, I'll actually show you. They're all right here. Oh, I'm on the wrong camera. Sorry. I was like, um, I can't see. Yes, they're all right there on the bench waiting to be. i got to brand them and do some of the finishing touches. So almost 200 straps uh, ready for it. <laughs> um, so hopefully they'll be going out tomorrow. And um, if not tomorrow, some Friday and some Saturday. So they should all be going out now. And if the worst possible happens, they'll all be out by Monday. Um, so yes, they'll be going here soon. So <laughs> stay tuned. I'm trying to get through them all. Uh, it's, I've, I've got a few things to make them a little bit faster, but there's always something that comes up. But yes, straps will be coming out. And if I am making a, a few extra, so if you want to get in on this, you can still order them on my website uh, and get them out in this order. But once I run out of these ones, um, then I'm probably going to do another back order for another month or two. So I'm probably not going to do another run of straps until like late March, maybe April. We'll see. Can you do me um, a favor before you continue? What's that? That just looks a like hair fuzzy where you can oh, does it? where it is right this second. Let me focus this. Sorry about that. Not bad, but just a little. I got it. Move down ah, to focus on the bench. That's better. It's like yeah, I don't have anything to focus in midair. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Okay, um, let's go back onto this then. So then the nice thing about this is I can cut the tongue with it here, and then as long as my iron is the right width, I can rotate this around and then cut the groove. And just have one tool to do both. And again, it just runs down until it hits that depth stop. This is just a lot of fun. Got another question while I'm doing this? I have lots of questions. Okay, what's that? Um, let's see, James Friedman asks, was going to start my first venture into the woodworking world tonight, but I made the mistake of buying a Harbor Freight hand pump and I can't get it to work. The iron pops off every time. Um, the uh, best answer for Harbor Freight hand plane is uh, get rid of it. <laughs> um, honestly, you can tune one of those up. Sorry, i got to fix Sarah's microphone before I forget about it. My so. voice seems Yes, uh, I forgot to move her microphone down. But you can get, oh, yeah. um, you, you can get a Harbor Frame plane in tune, but it will not stay there. And so no matter what you do, Hello, can you go? Hello. <laughs> no matter what you do, uh, it is a junk plane. Um, th there really is no a good way to say that it will stay that way or work on it. Uh, you can turn it into a scrub plane, put a big camber on the iron. Um, I have a video on how to make a scrub plane, but honestly, those planes just are trash. They're, they're a boat anchor. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry, there's really no way around it. There's, there's no reason to buy one of those or one from a big box store. Some people have had good luck with the um, Irwin plane. There's one brand of Birdwalks big box store that a couple people have had good time with, but a lot of people have had bad time with, and so it's kind of like a 50-50 thing. Um, but basically, if a plane costs less than $40 new, it's trash. Um, don't buy it. <laughs> um, yeah, let me show you what we've got here. So we've got our groove and we got our tongue, and theoretically this should just slide together like that. Just like butter. And that is what I'm looking for. Really nice tongue and groove fit. And the nice thing about the 45 is it's just quick and easy to set it up. You can make the that groove. That was a 48. Uh, 48 and make the tongue. But there are other ways to do it. And one of the big things I was told when I was... Oh, um, let me put the tongue on this one. Is why not use a Stanley 45 or 55? And yes. You can use a Stanley 45 or 55 to do the exact same thing. And in this, I have set up on here. Here, let me see if I got this in focus. Right here. I have set up on here a grooving iron. And this grooving iron, uh, excuse me, a tonguing iron. This tongue iron has an iron here and an iron here. And it's all set up and connected into one piece. And so you can see, let me move it down in there, you can see where there is a split in between so it can create a tongue. 
And then I have the two skates set up here. So there's one skate in the middle of one tongue, one skate in the middle of the other tongue. And then the fence hangs underneath the iron. Uh, let me see if I can show it over here. This is a hard one to get into. The fence overhangs the iron so it's the right depth in. And so generally what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a marking gauge and I'm going to lay out my two sides of my tongue, at least do it oh, once. Oh, hang on, hang on. You need to focus. Oops, sorry. There you oh, go. Better. I'm going to use a marking gauge. I'm going to lay out the two sides of the tongue I want. And then I can set the plane on there and adjust everything back and forth until the plane is running the way I want. So I did that all ahead of time to save a little bit of time on this. Got another question while I'm doing this? Um, yeah, hang on. Uh, let's see. Brian Ross said, not sure if this was answered yet, but how was the tool show? How what? How was the tool show? Oh, it was really good. It, was probably, it is the best tool show in the South. Um, probably second or third best tool show I've ever been to other than nationals. Uh, the nationals are just better, but yeah. So there we have our, our tongue. And for our groove, I'm going to use the Stanley 45. The groove is a lot easier to set up because the, the groove, you just need one iron. So if I look here in the bottom, I just have a quarter inch iron on here. I have a fence set up. And whenever I make the tongue, I'm going to set the plane on top of that tongue and then line everything up so that the, the iron on the 45 is then lined up with the tongue that I already cut. And if I cut the tongue first, then I will set the, uh, the 55 up to whatever the tongue was. And then we can cut a groove. And I just, I don't know why. This, cutting grooves with hand tools is one of the big reasons I got into hand tools. Because it's just so simple and so fast. And the amount of time it takes me to cut this, you've barely pulled a router off of a shelf. And there, I have a groove, just like that. <laughs> I mean, that's just... That a groove is something that a, a hand tool can almost always do faster than a router. Um, the only thing where the router is better is when you have to do a whole room full of them. Um, then that's faster. So let me just see. How do these fit together? Well, they fit together like a tongue and groove joint. And uh, I am just getting really happy with these. No butter? You always say butter. Yes. They, 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 they go together like... Uh, like a hot knife through butter. There you go. Um, but these are pretty obvious, and these are really expensive. And so you don't have a 48, you don't have a 45, you don't have a 55. What else can you do? So let me actually create a tongue, uh, create a groove with a router plane. And this was one of those things that was kind of like one of those aha moments for me, is that you can set up a router to do... Um, uh, to do plowing. And I'm going to show you some of the details on this because this is kind of um, funky how it is, how it's actually set up. It's here I have a depth, a, uh, a fence set up on here. So the fence is a quarter inch away from the cutter and the cutter is a quarter inch wide. But then I also have this rod sticking out here and this rod is sticking out slightly less than the cutter. So the rod is a little bit lower than the tip of the cutter. And basically this becomes the sole of the plane. So if I'm using a 45 here, there is a piece of the plane here that is stopping the cutter from going too deep. And with a normal router plane, there's nothing stopping the cutter from going too deep. So if you put this little pin up here, that will stop the cutter from going too deep. And then also, I have this plate here which closes up the throat um, on the 71, because the 71 has this big open throat here. You need something to support the front of this if you're going to do it. So with this, I can come back here. And I can take a little bit off, holding it tight against there. And on the first pass, I just go a little bit slower. And then right at the end, I have to be careful because at the end, this pin isn't sticking out, so it wants to drop off. And then every pass after that, I can go a little bit faster until I get down to the depth I'm looking for. Still being careful at the end. Clean it out so I can see it. Any questions while I'm doing this? You silly man. There's always questions. <laughs> All right, so... Sounds like the chat's fairly live tonight. Um, we have a very cosmopol cosmopolitan group. Very diverse. <laughs> Anyways, um, so Boss Gaming 8700, I believe is kind of new to woodworking, has a couple questions. One is, 
that they're just getting started in woodworking and any tips and then how you sharpen those blades and i believe was referring to the 48 when that comment went um, through well, first things first, the, the best tip I can give to most people when they're first getting started is do not be afraid of making mistakes. Most people are terrified of making mistakes, and that keeps everyone from, from doing more. Um, and the best thing you can do is jump in and make a whole pile of mistakes. Where did my thing go? Oh, I moved it for me. Fine. Hmm? Oh, so I can Okay. Do you want it back up there? Uh, that way I can see what I'm doing. You don't need... <laughs> you look there. I look here. Oh, I, I don't have it over here. I, you know what? <laughs> this is my um, workstation. You go the here. best advice I can get you is is keep your wife out of the shop. Um. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> best I get advice I can give you is make mistakes. Y'all um, heard that. And I just made a big mistake. You all heard that. <laughs> um, be willing to make mistakes. I mean, literally. Go Apparently, out that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome to the My Right Shop, where I stick my foot in my mouth regularly. I'm flexible. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, they don't find your hands. <laughs> I'm a man, but I can change. <laughs> if I have to, I guess. Um... <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, yes. Best advice for a new woodworker. Um, be willing to make mistakes. Get out of the shop, grab a board, and trash the board. Make cuts in it, make chops in it, slice away on it, cut grooves, cut dados, cut tenons, and get to know the tools. Um, especially if you're working with hand tools, this isn't something that you can just pick up and do. Your first work is going to look bad. Oh, well, get used to it. And you can't get good work until you've done some bad work. So be willing to get out in the shop and make those mistakes and make the problems and you'll be surprised at how cool things actually become after you've done a few mistakes and then you get one that fits together perfectly and it's like, oh, this is awesome. Um, so get over the fear of making mistakes and, and make those mistakes because those are what you need to do in order to learn more. But uh, yeah. All right, let's um, get back to this. So we've cut. Whoa. I have an extra couch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So we cut the groove with the router plane. Uh, now, how do we actually cut a tongue? Now, I could set up the router plane and move the cutter over to one side and cut one half of the tongue, and then move the router over to the other side and cut the other half of the tongue. Or I could get a rabbit plane um, or a rabbit saw, like um, a curfing plane. Wow, I haven't used this one in a while. It's dusty. Um, a kerfing plane is commonly thought of for making um, kerfs when resawing, um, but its older name is a rabbiting saw or a rabbiting plane. Um, and this would allow you to cut a saw cut in a certain distance. So you can cut from one side and then cut from the other side so you can cut out that rabbit. But if you hold it up, it looks like a baby piano. Like a no, baby piano? No, 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 no. Straight. But, okay, yeah, yeah. You, you're holding it. Yeah. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> but if you do, it looks like a little baby piano. Oh, I, oh I see like this. Ah, uh, we uh, got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in this case, I'm going to use a moving filister plane. And this is a rabbiting plane, but it also has a fence and a depth stop and all these fun thingamajigs that make it really enjoyable. And so on here, you can see. There is the uh, rabbiting cutter, but it also has this fence that can move in and out so I can cut a specific depth. And then it has a depth stop on here so I can cut a certain depth. But in this case, I'm actually going to lay it aside and cut a rabbit here and cut a rabbit here. But before I do that, I actually want to create a line on here that lets me know where to stop. And so I'm going to grab this that I did earlier, and it's already set up to the marks for my marking gauge. And I'm going to ooh, cut a chunk out of there. Oops. I'm going to set these on here, and I'm going to put two marks on this side, or two marks all the way down. And these marks are what I'm going to run to, rather than using the rather than using the depth stop on this. Are you going to? Sorry, are you going to be on that? What's that? It just looks a tad out of focus again. But it, there. Yeah, there we go. Um, so rather than just using the depth stop to know how far into the board to go, because I'm running on the side here. I'm actually going to go until I remove that line. Now this takes a little bit longer. And 
with woodworking, you can always save money by spending time. And you can always spend money to save time. So in this case, I'm using a much, much older tool, a much, much simpler tool that most people could make in their shop. And it takes a little bit longer to cut through it because i got to cut one side and then cut the other. But it still gets done. It does the same thing. So any questions while I'm doing this? Uh, I'm sure there are plenty. Let's see. Let me um, back up a little bit so for you. Robert Thalen, or Thalen, that is apparently the name of the knight, um, says, I have a wooden tongue and groove plane for half-inch stock. Can I use it for thicker stock? And if so, how? Sure. Um, just understand that the tongue will not be in the middle of the board. And there is no need for the tongue to be in the middle of the board. And if you look really closely at all of these tongues that I'm making today, none Ooh. of them are precisely in the middle of the board. They're all off to one side or the other a little bit, which really doesn't make any difference at all other than to the perfectionist who has to have the tongue in the middle of the board. There's nothing saying that uh, it has to be there. The only thing with a half inch uh, tongue and groove plane is that it's going to be cutting a much smaller tongue so that tongue will not be as strong but the tongue and groove joint is not for strength it's for alignment so it should not create any issue at all as long as you don't mind it not being in the middle what else we got let's see um c and f c w p haven't figured that one out yet <laughs> how do you price your work i don't i don't sell anything i make um and I, that really kind of confuses people. Aren't you a woodworker? Yes, but I don't sell what I make because I'm a hand tool woodworker. Uh, for instance, my table, if I were to sell my table and it was made by power tools, I would charge about $15,000. And that would cover my time and the uh, products I have into it. But with hand tools, the amount of time I have into it, it would end up taking, it would end up costing somewhere around $25,000. And unfortunately, there are not many people out there willing to pay $25,000 for a table. So I probably could find some. Um, it's not really common. The other nice thing about doing it with this, um, so to answer your question, basically, usually when I sell things, I add up all the, uh, all the items it's going to take to create it, um, add in like 10% to that for tools, um, unless I know of a specific tool I need to purchase for it. And then I go by a day rate. Um, so if I'm not including the items required to make it, my day rate is $200 a day. Um, so, or, or it's usually around um, $250 a day. So I know if it's gonna take me 10 days, that's $2,500 that I add to the, the cost of the item. Um, and that's my common way. A lot of people like to do it by hours. Um, if I don't know exactly how much material it's going to take, I have a day rate of $500, um, unless it's something I, I don't know even more about. If there's a lot of unknowns, I'll do a day rate of like $800, um, and that's including uh, material and um, labor. Um, but a lot of people like to figure it by hours, so yeah. Um, oh, here, let me show you this then. So we've created the tongue, and I have the, the groove that we made earlier. But they're not quite fitting together. Let me zoom in a little bit more for you here. So they're, they're just not fitting. If I've got a hammer, I could shove them down in there. And I have a couple things I can adjust them. And the nice thing with the tongue is I could come in with a shoulder plane like this. This is the, basically the exact same thing, but without the depth stop and cutter. And I can make that tongue a little bit thinner. Let's see if that was enough. I think I need to go one more pass. Or, because I was using this already, I can already just do this. Bring it down one more shaving on this side. One more shaving on this side. Let's see how close we are. There we go. That is slicker than snot on a doorknob. And let me tell you, that's a slick thing. But this is the fun part. And with hand tools, we have all of these jigged tools that we've created that hold everything to a fine hole. The problem is with these jigged tools, they cost a lot of money. Well, what if you don't have these jigged tools? What if all you have is a saw and a chisel? 
can you make a tongue and groove joint with a saw and a chisel? So that's what I really want to show because no matter what you have, and I like to use all of these tools because they are fun to use. But when I was first starting, I didn't have a Stanley 45. I didn't have a 55. I didn't pick up this uh, 48 until a few months ago. Um, and I usually like to show these in my video because they're fun to work with and they're fun to show. But a lot of people then look at them and say, well, I can't do that because I don't have that tool. So I want to show you that even if you just have a simple saw and chisel, you can do the same thing. Well, in this case, I'm also going to use a marking gauge. Um, but if you wanted to, you could take a board, put a, a nail in it, and run that across. Um, but marking gauges are pretty easy to come by. So I think I'm safe with that. Any questions while I set this up? Oh, this let's one. see. Colton Morris asks, why is there no sliding section on the 45? Sliding section on the 45. Oh, um, I took the... I took the second skate off. Um, so the, the 45 also comes with, with a second skate, and so you can put that on there. But for a thin cutter like this one, it's only a quarter inch cutter, you only need the one skate. Um, so usually I don't put a second skate on until the cutter gets over a half inch. Uh, that's a good question. Because a lot of people think you always have to use the other skate, you, you don't. It's, All it's right, what did you, there it goes. Oh, it's moving! Who did uh, what? Justin Ford said thank you. Hey, Justin, thank you. You're my new favorite person. I think you should still have to dance. Oh, should I dance? <laughs> you gotta learn Thanks, some Justin. new moves. What's that? <laughs> said you gotta learn some new moves. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so let's cut, uh, Let's first cut the groove, because the groove is the, the more challenging one, though it actually takes the least amount of time. And let me move back over to this camera. Oh, now I lost my clicker. There it is. Oh, okay. wait, we had lines. I thought we weren't supposed to have lines anymore. Oh, it does that every now and then. Sadness. But it also allows me to do the upper right-hand corner overhead shot. <laughs> oh, they're out of sync. Ah! Oh. Stink. I gotta figure that out now. <laughs> so let's cut a groove in this. So the first thing I wanna do is grab a marking gauge and lay out where I want that groove to be. So a quarter inch in from one side, a half inch in from the other side, from the same side. Now I'm not gonna put a quarter inch line from this side and a quarter inch line from this side. I wanna mark everything off of one side. And I'm always going to be marking off the same sides. And this one I have a line running down the middle. That lets me know I'm always referencing off of this side. The line is there because it was a mistake from another project. I'm just using that to remember mark from this side, not this side. Always reference off the same side. Now I have those on there. I want to cut a depth stop. How deep do I want this to go? And so I'm just going to use that same quarter inch marker. And I'm going to mark on the end here, a quarter inch down and a quarter inch down. And then the fun part. I'm going to pull out a little Paul Sellers here, grab a knife, and I'm going to, on that line, just cut in a small wedge running all the way across there. And Paul Sellers has coined the term knife wall, though this is a very, very old trick that goes back hundreds of years. Uh, the word knife wall is actually a newer one. Let me zoom in a little closer and let you see this. So I have that, that marking gauge cut that went down a little ways, and then I can use this to come in. It just peels out a little V. And you I lied. rarely use this. What's you that? You said you were just going to do it with a chisel and a saw. But then oh, again, yeah, I had to pull out a pocket knife. Now, if I wanted to... <laughs> I find it hard to believe that most of them wouldn't I could have just a grab pocket a, knife. I could grab a chisel, and I could do the exact same thing with a chisel and just use the chisel. But I've got a pocket knife. How many people out there don't have a pocket knife? I'm sure there's someone in some country that they're I... illegal, but, you know... <laughs> Um, and then the nice thing about that is I can set my saw in that line as long as I don't push the saw. In other words, I'm just lightly letting the saw slide in that groove. It will cut right down. And I'm just going to cut down until I get down to that depth. Just like that. I'm down that line. And i got to go a little farther on this side. There we go. Let me back this up a little bit so you can see more of that. And I'm going to do the other side. Set it right into that groove. Was that true I heard you say knife wall? 
I did say knife wall. She knows what it is? I'm impressed. I love my wife. Now you love me. <laughs> that one didn't ever end. <laughs> and we're down to depth there and down to depth there. And it's really that simple. Um, it doesn't, the problem with most people, why they want to jump off is that they're putting so much force into it and they're driving into it with everything they've got. You don't want to do that. Let the saw do the work and have a very loose grip on the saw. So if the, the saw really isn't, isn't, isn't solidly connected to you. It's just, you are the moving piston that pushes this forward. Let the saw do the work and it will go straight as long as the saw is decent. Then I'm going to come in here. I'm going to go close to that marking gauge line, that line I put in. Oop. Right there. I'm just going to spear out a little bit, go and bevel down and with a stabbing motion. I'm going to go across a little ways, come around to this side. And there should be a disclaimer running across the bottom here. Never ever chisel towards yourself. Yeah, I have a video <laughs> camera, so I'm shooting towards myself here. Otherwise, I'd come around, but the video camera's in my way. And then, just like that, we have a groove. And Da -da, that's it. Now, if I really wanted to get precise, I could get out a depth stop. And this is a fun little tool that I got this last year at the Pacific Northwest Tool Collectors. Um, and so this I can slide in here because I have this end right on that. I can slide it across and see, uh-oh, I'm, I'm high here in the middle. So now we can come in and go all the way down to that line. And just with that stabbing motion, peel it up. And this is basically a router plane. It's just a handheld router plane. Uh-oh, she's turtling. Oh, B Power is now getting the look from his wife because he's watching us. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. B Power. It's okay. His wife's here too. <laughs> so there's our groove. Now we need to make a tongue to go in there. And the tongue is going to be basically the same thing, except for we have to cut the sides as well. So I'm going to lay out my lines. Okay, hang on. And cut refocus. Infinite... Refocus. What? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm going to lay out my lines just like I did before. And then I'm going to cut in from the top just like I did before. But rather than cleaning it out with the, with the, uh, the chisel, I'm going to then come in from the sides. So um, on this point, I also need to turn this this way and use that quarter inch side and put a mark down here. Go around the ends, around the end, and so while I'm doing this, there might be some other questions. Nope, there's nurse porn at looking at the veins, but anyways. What's that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you heard me. Why do I even ask? <laughs> I just need to make sure I take the, the chip off of the right side so that I don't... Uh, cut out the wrong side this I want to stay on the right side of the line unless I should be on the left side then I'm gonna stay on the left side of the line <laughs> what you got let's see uh, Tess Flynn asked ever hear of a Stanley number 50 yes um, if I remember correctly the Stanley number 50 is the cut down version of the Stanley 45 but I could very well be wrong because I'm not very good with the Stanley numbering system. A lot of people out there are. I'm not. Uh, what else you got? <laughs> it's like woodworking support group. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're in the dark on that one for a while. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and read um, some things here. <laughs> Colored Squid asks, James, have you ever heard of pond yachts? They were once a fun pastime. Would you consider making one? Heard of what? A pond yacht. A pond yacht. I don't know I'm if it's a little it's a boat, boat or a pond. I, I have not heard Big of that. Big prizes for small boats. Uh, one day I might make a boat, but uh, I don't have any direct need to. And so it's down my list of ways. The next thing I'm building is the uh, uh, bed. So that's now high on the list. I don't know. You might not get to sleep in that bed now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to build my wife's bed, and then once I'm done with that, I might build my own bed. It's a little one. It has to fit out there in that little dog house. <laughs> that dog we don't have. Well, I said so for next week's live. <laughs> yes. 
Are you ready for another question? Yeah. All right. Trump UKJM um, asks, what's the best wood to make a table? <laughs> there is no best way. Anytime someone asks a question, what is the best, my immediate answer is there is no best. Okay. Um, Did you hear way or wood? What's that? The question was wood. The best wood? Uh, yeah, there is no okay. best. Um, the, it depends on the table. It depends on what you want. It depends on your look. Generally, hardwoods are better, but there are times when softwoods are better. Um, they, there, there are so many different varieties of table and methods of table that there, there is no such thing as best. Um, sorry, I, I would love to say, yes, it's oak, um, because I like oak, but there, there is, is no best. Um, now, when I set up for this, I'm actually going to set up some dogs. And I literally just drill holes into the end of my bench, and that's how I store my dogs. They're just in a hole in the end. And then I'm going to slide the dogs in here, and this will allow me to cut on the edge this way. Um, make oh sure my, my line is on all there because it's the hard to see. All of a sudden. And I'm going to do the exact same thing I did on the end, on the edge, but now I'm going to do it on here. So I'm going to grab my knife. Cut into that line. I'm going to change the camera back here. Any other questions? Oh, yes. They keep on coming. Um, just say oak. Uh, let's see. Mike Evans asked, I may have missed something, but is there any reason why you couldn't use the curfing plane to saw in the walls of a groove? I think you might have talked about that. Yeah, no, right I use the curfing plane. That's, uh, that's one thing I pointed out. That's actually its original use. Um, Tom Fidgen popularized it to do kerfing cuts for the big frame saw. Um, but historically, the, uh, the use was actually to do this. So you could set it up. It's got a fence and a saw, and so you can set it up on here and saw in. Actually, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it for this one because it's pretty close to where it should be. I'll be at one side a little low, but I can use this. And this particular one is one from, um, um, uh, oh, come on. Uh, Blackburn tools and he has this these deep gullets on here so they don't clog up Getting close to depth already And so this is a fun tool and this is an old I have an old video on making this one because it is a a, uh, a great tool to have if you are, especially if you're getting new and resawing. This makes resawing a lot easier. Uh, I don't use it much anymore because I've gotten fairly good with my saw cuts, so it's not something I really need to mess with anymore. And just like that, I've got that piece in here, and I'm just going to come in and clean this out a little bit because there's always some little junk and whatnot. <laughs> so much for using hand saw and chisel. Well, I did the exact same thing with a saw. That's what they're saying, not me. I'll do the other side with the chisel and show you how it's done. So now this is now this isn't uh, six ways. This is seven ways. Now that I brought in the the curving plane. Once again, do not chisel towards yourself. Yes. And then I can just use this. All I see is your out. head in the one corner. <laughs> What's that? When you're doing it, oh, all the I see is your shot. head. <laughs> I still can't see anything. It's there we go. So let's do the same thing again on this side. Except I'll do it with the saw, just for those people who are annoying me. What other questions we got? Let's see. Um, Moonwolf seventy one asked, "What?" It says, "What for marking ga gauge are you using?" I don't know if it's. Um, the marking gauge I'm using, this one is a Veritas um, uh, mortising gauge. So it has the two pins, they're both wheels. Uh, so the one wheel has the flat side on the inside, one wheel has the flat side on the outside. So it's great for doing <laughs> mortising work, but in this case where I'm doing tongue and groove, I can use it for both sides of that. So there we've cut our knife wall. Get these out of the way. Do the same thing again here. Put it into the groove. 
slice it down until that little piece falls off. <laughs> That's not a chisel. Yeah, at least slide it around oh, so you can actually see the piece come off. Or saw. What other question you got? Um, I'm getting pressured into putting the hockey game. I'm Canadian and there's... <laughs> <laughs> um, hot Noodle Soup, Hot Noodle Workshop asked, would you do it the same size for soft and hardwood? Yes. Um, again, the, the tongue and groove joint is not for strength. The tongue and groove joint is um, for alignment. So uh, strength-wise, there really isn't a huge issue one way or the other. So I'm just going to clean this out. I was at a slight angle with that saw, so I have to bring it back to 90 degrees here. So I'm just going to chop down a little ways. And so normally I'd come in here with a shoulder plane and clean up like that. But in this case, I'm showing you how to do it without it. I'm limiting myself. And just like that. Now the moment of truth. We cut it with all saw and chisel, well, except for the other one. And it should pop together like that. That's actually one of my best ones yet today. I like that. Nice, simple, clean, and done with just the basic saw and chisel. And of course, don't forget um, the uh, curving plane. <laughs> <laughs> so there, we have um, seven different ways to make a tongue and groove joint. And we have gotten really groovy with this video. Oh, dear. <laughs> you were waiting for it. Or at least someone out there is waiting for it. So, I mean, what other questions do we have? We give it like uh, 15 minutes left. If you, anyone has something they want to see, I'm going through okay, them below. Okay, let's we get through the probably questions. Probably won't we... get enough time to get through them all. So, let's see what we've got on the list. Hang on. <laughs> all right. Dave Snyder asks, how about wood roses to make up? Wood roses? To make for moi. Ah, yes. Ah. Um, I've never actually made a wood rose. I should no. probably do that. It might make a good video. There's a couple of ways you can do it with the, the, the curls and actually twist the curls around to make a rose. He's done it origami and out of I have done silk. origami rose. I should do an origami wood curl rose. It's like cedar. Walnut. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right, let's see. Justin Ford asked, do you have any videos on shooting boards? Uh, yes, I actually have a video on making my current shooting board. Um, I don't use it much, as you can tell. Um, uh, Shooting boards are really nice and, and quick for, for cleaning up the end of a joint. Uh, but most of the time, if I'm going to clean up the end of a joint, I'm just going to put it in my vise and plane off the end nice and flat and square. Um, I, I, the shooting board is a jig that I have to pull out, I have to set up, I have to get the board right, I have to clean off the rest of my bench because the board sticks down. Um, so I really don't use the shooting board that much. Um, yeah, I, I used to use it all the time, but now I, I don't. But if you want to see that video, um, it's an older one. It's like two to three years old, so you have to go back and look at it. Maybe I'll make another one here soon because they are, they are fairly quick and easy to make. It's basically a, uh, uh, a bench hook, but with a slot that the plane can ride in. But maybe next time. All right. What else we got? John Lockery asked, what side would you put a bead groove? What size would I put a side. bead? Side. Oh, um, I usually put the bead on the tongue side of the board. Um, and what he's saying is that it, um, it used to be common that when you did, let me back this up a little bit so you can see this. Um, it used to be common <laughs> when you did tongue and groove that you would put a bead on one side or the other and that bead would then hide the joint. And so if there was any imperfection from one side to the other, you'd put a bead on there, um, especially for like wainscoting, and it would make this joint disappear. So if there's any variance in this, that bead would make everything look better. Uh -oh, so usually Asian. I put the bead on the tongue side um, because it has to cut in a little bit here and a little bit here. <laughs> if you put it on the groove side, you may end up cutting down into the, uh, the groove you're cutting out. So it kind of weakens that a bit. Um, so generally put it on the tongue, but I mean, there really isn't a huge issue because you're not taking a lot of material off of that. No. What else we got? Um, well, we have an invader. Yes. Hey, JJ. Um, Colored Squid asks, James, do you ever wish Veritas made their wheel gauges the shape of an octagon so they don't roll off the bench? <laughs> um, well, with the, the one wheel gauge, that is a problem because it comes out of the middle. 
Uh, whereas with the, the two wheel gauge, they're off, they're off center, so it always lays flat. Um, but I always like the shape of an octagon better. It looks better to me than something that's round. Um, so yes, I would prefer that. But the, the, the mortising gauge doesn't have, much, haven't, doesn't have as much issue because it's off center. Um, I actually don't have a Veritas regular marking gauge. Um, maybe one of these days. Yes. What else? I'm pointing at yourself. Well, no. we're actually caught up. Um, we're caught up with questions? We are. <gasps> but we might have to stop early so B Power doesn't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. What does uh, that say? Hang on. Oh, hot noodle, shush. Hot noodle workshop asks, show us your frame and bow saws. Um, yeah. Here, Mommy. this is, is actually, let me show you a little bit of the difference between a, a frame and a bow saw because this really gets confusing. Um, this is a bow saw. Anything where the tensioning string or cable is on the outside and the saw is on the outside, it's a bow because it's like a string, like a bow. Um, whereas, this is a frame saw. This is not a bow saw because there's a frame that goes around the saw. Um, and so this is a, a Rubeau style frame saw. And I made several of these. I think I have like three videos on making frame saws. Um, this Ooh. one I made mm, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and uh, this, is, this is my favorite. This, is, this thing is just so much fun. It's a 32 yeah. inch uh, saw. The kit is from Blackburn Tools. Um, the same kit that I got for my, my curfing plane. And uh, this is a lot of fun to use. Um, for bow saws, I, mean, I have a whole bunch of them. I've got the turning saw that I made. Uh, this is a continental style joinery saw. So when um, most of Europe and America went to back saws, um, continental Europe um, held on to bow saws. Um, they're quick and easy to make in comparison. Um, they don't take a whole lot of jury rigging. They're just a, a simple thing. Uh, and then I also have my buck saw, which is currently tucked down uh -oh. in there. But more invaders. A couple others. Uh -huh. Okay, Melody, JJ, go. Okay. We're finishing up the live. <laughs> we'll see you guys in a little bit. Bye. Um, yeah, so that is one that confuses a lot of people. Is they can't, they don't know the difference between a frame saw and a bow saw, um, or they call a frame saw a bow saw or a bow saw a frame saw. So they are two very different things. Oh. Yeah. What else we got? Uh, that's it. Well, you want to call it early? I have no problem doing cool. so. Well, then, um, since we uh -oh, have more hang on, hang on. We always have a last minute question. Joshua <laughs> Lucas just asked, Is that also a Blackburn bow saw? Um, no, no, my uh, my my turning saw is um, from uh, Tools for Working Wood. Um, what's the company that actually makes it? Um, Oh, it's, it's killing me now. Gramercy Tools, there we are. Uh, they made the, the kit for the turning saw. And I have a video on making that as well. If, you, if you're ever looking for a video that I made, just search in the, the search bar, wood by right, whatever you want. So wood by right turning saw, and you'll, you'll come across that video. All right, and one more. But there's always one more. There's always one more. Jerome Cornette asked, quick marking gauge question. With a wooden gauge that holds a wedge, how do you micro adjust it? Do you just tap it with a mallet? Yes. Um, and I'll do the same thing often with this one. This one has a, a wooden screw that goes in. Um, but I'll turn the screw until it's just grabbing it. And sometimes I'll do that with a wedge and I'll, I'll tap the wedge in. Um, hmm. I have one with a wedge. But I don't know where I put it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just put a little bit of tension on it, and I'll I'll drop it on the the toe or the heel to move the slide up and down. And eventually, um, well, with the wedge, if you drop it the other way so that the wedge slides out, um, then you'll have to readjust it again. And so it kind of gets a little fiddly with that. Um, but it really doesn't take that much to to bounce back and forth. But usually, just it's feeling what that friction is. It's not completely set yet but it's still holding it. Just a couple light taps one way or the other, micro adjust it, and then you can come in and tap the wedge in completely. Um, but that's usually how I will adjust them. Um, though normally what I'll end up doing is rather than having to micro adjust them, as I put them on my work, and I'll put the pin where it needs to be, I'll slide the fence up against it, and then holding the fence in place, then I'll tap the wedge in. Um, and so that way I don't need to mess with micro adjusting, I'm holding it where it needs to be and then set the wedge. 
Um, but I'll do the same thing with the with the screws. Um, that way I'm not having to bounce them back and forth and checking it. But yeah. Is that it? Well, of course not. <laughs> it's just told James his shirt is the same color as a Toronto Maple Leaf shirt. I think my 10 minutes are up night all. <laughs> um, so Moonwolf asked, how many new tools did you pick up? I didn't know if you wanted to show off your tools you got real quick. Uh, yeah, and, let me show a couple of these. show with that. So I got um, this. I've been wanting to get a, uh, a Stanley 140 for a while. And a Stanley 140 is a uh, rabbiting block plane. And so it's got this side here that you can go right up against it, but it's also skewed. And so the skew is nice because it then pulls the iron up against whatever you're, you're running up against. Now, normally there's a plate on this side, so if you don't oh, want to use me. the rabbiting function, you can have a plate on there. It keeps this stronger. Uh, but this one was missing the plate, so I got it for a good deal. Um, it's marked 30. I think I paid 20 bucks for it, um, which is a phenomenal deal. With the plate, they're usually like 80, 85 bucks. Um, so I could make a plate in the future, but I have other block planes, so I don't really need to. I use this one for rabbiting, and so that's why I got this one. It needs a little bit of cleanup, but it's basically there. Uh, let's see. Ooh, oh, this is a cool one. This is a Sorby saw from Sheffield, England, and it is a brass back dovetail saw, and it has a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, it has the, uh, uh, the taper from one end to the other um, called uh, cant. Um, so this is when, it, when a saw is thinner here and thicker there, it has a cant to it. Um, I really like a dovetail, with that, a dovetail saw that, that, that my Blackburn Tools saw has a little bit of cant, not a whole lot. Um, but this one, I really want to clean up. The, the um, handle is in bad shape. So I'm going to make a whole new handle, and I want to do a really nice one with that. And I need two new nuts for it. But of course, I'm going to have to clean up the plate, completely refile it, clean up the brass, but it's a really nice brass back. Um, so this will turn into a, a gorgeous um, saw when I'm done with it. It's just going to take a good bit of work. So that video will be coming up here sometime. Uh, what else did I get? Oh, I got the slick. Um, and this one was kind of like, pull it out here, sorry. Uh, this one was kind of like the, uh, um, the talk of the show because it had this baseball bat um, that someone literally took a baseball bat and they trimmed it down and then put the slick onto it. And a slick is basically a big chisel, three inches wide, and this is for timber framing so you can clean out with things. And I want to do several videos coming up soon with timber framing, so I'm starting to collect some of the timber framing videos. Uh, this one has a little bit more of an angle up than I'd like, uh, but not bad. I think I might end up actually making a new handle, but I kind of like this baseball bat feel. Uh, I need to do a good bit of cleaning up on that, but it is not too far off. Um, ooh, oh, oh, this one's cool. Um, I've been wanting to get one of these for a while, but they're usually pretty expensive. Usually these are like 20, 30 bucks. It's a steel um, beam clamp. Um, so it's got those switches on there, very, very strong, um, uh, stronger than my, my wooden beam clamps, but uh, way, way stronger than I ever need. Um, but I got this for 10 bucks, which I was just like, oh, yes, take my money. <laughs> Actually, if you, if you watched the, the live walkthrough on Friday, um, I bought that in the live walkthrough because I saw it when I was walking through it. It's like 10 bucks. I'm like, hey, here, hold the camera for a second. I got to buy this thing. Um, and I got... Oh, 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 ah, yes, 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 yes. This is, this is a cool one. This is one I'm really looking forward to getting up and going. And this is something that you don't see very often. This is called a spill plane. And if you look at this, the iron is at this really major angle. It's straight up and down in here. And there's no ejection mouth on the side for the chips to come out. Um, it looks kind of like a molding plane, but it's not. What basically you do is this will create a curl that will come spiraling out here, and it'll be a stiff curl coming out. And that stiff curl coming out the side is called a spill. And this was made to make spills. It was not a woodworking tool for carpentry or uh, for finishing or anything like that. This was only designed to make spills. And those would be, uh, let me see if I've got one down here on the floor that's kind of like it. Uh, here, there's a spill. So this is kind of a spill. Uh, it's a really floppy spill. Normally there are bigger pieces and they're, they're stiff. But basically you could light one end and then take it around the room and light your candles or anything else you have in the, shop, in the house. Um, and so it was basically the old version of a match that you would have to light and then you could carry it around. And so this makes those. Uh, 
And it's kind of an old thing that no one knows about anymore, but I want to actually uh, collect these because they're, there's a bunch of different methods and a bunch of different types of spill planes. But this is, this is a, a really a beautiful one made of oak. I just couldn't pass it up. So uh, there were a few other things I got, but those are the, the big highlights. So uh, any other last minute questions? There are, but I think Where's there's it? more than we can just. Okay, let's do one more. Unless you have, do you have one specific one? Hang on. Or should I just call it? Uh, and then we're going to give away. A well, the first one, you want me, the first one that I had didn't ask is Bernard Greyhouse asks, ever tried a wood body version of a 48, Stanley 48? Wood body version of a Stanley 48. Um, I have never seen a wood body version where the fence swings around. Um, though that would be interesting. Um, in the past, I have made a set, uh, a wooden set of, um, of a tonguing plane and a grooving plane. Um, I have seen a wooden version kind of like a moving filister where the fence underneath can move back and forth. So you can move it in and out to create the tongue and groove. Um, and there are so many other types of, of tongue and groove planes out there. Um, Stanley actually made one where there's a handle both ways. And so on one side of the fence, you'd make the tongue. And then on the other side of the fence, you'd make the groove. Um, so one plane could do both without spinning this around. It just depended on which way you pushed it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of other things out there. So um, I'm going to be giving away a strop. And I think from now on, I'm going to be giving away something each live. So this should be kind of fun. I have a few other odds and ends, maybe a tool from around the shop or something of that nature. Um, but as I am in the process of making all my strops, I'll be giving away a strop and a piece of compound. So you get to pick which one you want. Um, so let's actually do... Oh, here, here's a fun one. Um, a video or two ago, I mentioned what this wood was. And the I bought it at a big box store and the first person to actually tell me what the big box store called this um, gets a strop. So I'm going to be looking for those in the chat. So what the big box store called it, yeah. not what it actually is. Not what it actually is, um, but what the big box store calls it, which was really kind of dumb. A block of it wood. It is not that. Um, yeah, it feels almost like balsa wood, but it cuts like a hardwood. Um, so it's actually a good wood for demonstration purposes, and I, I kind of like it, but it's fairly light. All right, y'all. Are you paying attention? Yes. Um, now, if I didn't get to your question or you want me to hit that, if you want me to answer something, go ahead and send me an email. Uh, I do try and get to most all of those. I don't get to them immediately, uh, but I can do that. You can find that on the About tab here on YouTube, um, or you can go to my website, woodbyright.com, and put in the, uh, the, the contact me form. They're all going back and looking at that video right now. No one's, <laughs> no one's put in a guess yet. <laughs> Wait, I have no, mahogany. mahogany. Yes, mahogany. Tyler Kimball. Tyler Kimball. Tyler. Dale um, Coons, I'm so sorry. You were like two yeah, seconds behind. Less than two seconds. <laughs> yeah, they, they call it mahogany, but it is not. It's not even a sapili. Um, I don't know what it is, and I'd love to find out, but it's like, um, yeah. So I buy it at Menards, and they call it mahogany. <laughs> it actually looks kind of like it when you oil it up, but uh, it's not. So, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Tyler Kimball, send me your contact. Uh, if you can send me uh, through the, the contact on my website or uh, uh, if you see me on Facebook, go ahead and do that. And I'll get you out a strop and compound. Just let me know if you want it in the center because um, I sell two different types. I sell one where the logo... Oh, I've got that one over there. Uh, I sell one where the, the logo is up here in the center. I just haven't branded these yet. And then another one where it's in the corner. So some people like one or the other. Oops, there's the corner. Um, as well as the, the compound. Or just go on my website and look at what options I have. Woodbyright.com backslash shop. Uh, so I think that's about it. And Anything I'm forgetting? if you're not signed up, Woodbyright Hive Mind. Yes. Insider info tips. Put up a few questions. live videos on there and have other fun. It's on Facebook. Cool. Well, I think that'll about do it. And until next time. Stay groovy with it.